Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for this On One Live event. I'm joined now by my good friend, Hudson Henry. Hudson, you out there? I certainly am. How's everybody doing? I imagine most people are kind of holed up like, like I am. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. Yes. <laughs> but hopefully we'll have some fun today. We'll do, uh, we'll, we're going to talk about some presets. Before we get started, um, someone do me a favor. Let me know the audio is okay. You can hear Hudson and I out there. Um, use the little Q&A chat there at the bottom of the Zoom window to confirm that uh, we're all good from a technical standpoint. And uh, then we'll get started. Sounding good. All right. Looks like everything's all good. Um, I want to share. We had a poll question for those that showed up early. There was, uh, what is your favorite thing to photograph? And we've essentially got about a three way tie between seascapes, mountains, sunrise, and sunsets, with mountains starting to pull away a little bit. Um, not as interested in the forest or the uh, astro, but that's kind of a fun little poll. Hopefully that uh, helped pass the time for you guys. And Hudson, what's your favorite uh, landscape to photograph? Well, you know, I, I put my vote in for mountains because I think my whole love of photography kind of grew out of my love of spending time in the mountains growing up here in the Northwest, following a cousin of mine who's kind of a world-class climber and, you know, having these adventures out in the mountains, looking down on the land below, just there was something great about bringing those stories back to family. So I, I kind of think of my roots being in the mountains, but I love I loved all those categories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same as me. I think I'm, I'm probably a big fan of sunrise, sunset, uh, ocean views, definitely. Well, before we get started here, I just want to make quick announcements. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted, posted to the On One Video Library shortly after it airs. Um, if you have questions for me or questions for Hudson as we're going through, go ahead and use the Q&A chat there in the Zoom window. And... Um, the topic today is Hudson's favorite feature, using presets. And we're going to talk about uh, using presets, customizing presets, and saving presets in On One Photo Raw 2020. So uh, without further ado, I will hand it over to the man, Mr. Uh, Hudson Henry. Well, hey, everybody. I I'm here in my studio, and I'm really, really blessed that my studio is just across the yard from my house on my property. Uh, and so... It, it, it's easy for me to hole up in here and get some work done, do some editing. And today when we talk about presets, I really want to talk about them uh, in sort of three separate categories, like using them and how I think they can really speed up your workflow, but they're not an end all and be all. It's not a click it and forget it. You know, there, there's got to be a little bit of individual sauce uh, customization for every single different image because every image is a little bit different. Uh, and then I want to talk about how you can learn from them. You know, if you're a person who hasn't spent a whole lot of time in photo raw or in effects, uh, I think that you can, you can sort of backwards reverse engineer presets from your, your favorite collection, whether it's the on one stock presets or something you downloaded, you know, from Matt Laskowski or Nicole or me, uh, and, and see how that person that created the preset did it. So you can start applying that in your own workflow. And then finally talk a little bit about some methods that I've used to kind of create presets. I, I have kind of an interesting history, I think, with presets. I remember when I was first doing work with On One, and when I first really started exploring On One, this is long before RAW, uh, back in the old photo suites, the perfect photo suites. Uh, you know, one of the first things that, that the On One crew asked me is, well, do you use presets? Do you like to use presets? And, and in other software that I had used mostly, I found that presets often sort of nuked the basic processing of your image you know that to really get adjustments that made a profound difference in your image presets were not necessarily all that useful I, I worked a lot in photoshop with actions that would do specific things to images and you know just to save clicks sort of it wasn't until i really started exploring on one's presets that i realized how how absolutely powerful they are because they're not applied to the underlying raw processing you, I mean, if they're made correctly, I, I, I particularly like effects presets so that you do your raw processing, then you can go through, have a look at how some different effects presets are going to look on your image uh, and, and, and choose one and use that as a starting point. It can just save a whole lot of clicking, uh, particularly if you find a set that you like to use. And let, let me show you what I'm talking about. I'm going to jump in here. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, there we go. 
screen share should be up. And All right, yeah, and while you guys are at home, just realize there's a little couple view options in the Zoom window. If you're having a hard time, do it. Try to tinker with the view options to get the full screen. Sorry to interrupt, Hudson. You oh, no worries, no worries. Hopefully everybody's seeing my screen. I, I haven't gone through and, and sort of picked out a whole set of images that are all customized for this, but what I've done is just thrown up some images from, from workshops or workshop scouting over the last six months or so and some images of my kids and stuff. And we'll just, we'll just run through some and play around with it. Uh, I've got some shots here from, from last winter's Death Valley workshop with, with my good buddy Rick LePage. And you know, this image is a brisky point. I've been out there so many times and just never gotten an interesting cloudscape at dawn with any kind of light. The light was muted, it was coming through some cloud, but it was a beautiful, beautiful kind of interesting cloudscape, better than I've usually gotten there. I keep waiting for the day when I'm gonna be up there at the right time when there's color uh, and I haven't gotten it yet. It's usually just absolutely clear. We sometimes call that a Kluskowski layer when, when you either have a whiteout and there's no texture in the sky or it's absolutely clear. <laughs> there was a little period where Matt was going through a rough spot and we call it a Kluskowski layer when there are no clouds. So, you know, I want to I want to talk about how, you know, the first thing I'm going to do, even if I'm going to use a preset, is process this image. So this is, a, uh, I think, a Nikon Z7 uh, image with my 24 to 70, if I'm correct. And the first thing I like to do, I mean, everybody's got a little different method. I hold down the J key to see highlight and shadow masking. So as I pull my highlight slider, I'm gonna see as I blow that blue channel in the sky out. You can see it happening live on the histogram on your levels view up above. If I'm holding down that J key, oops, and I, there you go. You start to see that red in the sky as I blow that blue channel out. I'm gonna back off till I'm not doing that uh, and I'm actually watching that level. So I want to kind of keep all my blue from quite going out into pure white. The right side of the histogram is pure white. The left side is pure black. And then I want to do the same thing with blacks. So and what I'm doing here is really creating more contrast in my image. I might back this off just a little bit, kind of looking at the image too, these, these hills and, the, and the, uh, the mountains back here. I don't want that direct light to be pure white. I'm going to hold down the J key and I'm going to pull the black slider and I'm going to watch for the shadows in those foreground badlands to start going black. There's some little tiny bits of black that aren't even showing up in the levels, but I'm seeing them in there. I want a little bit of black in the scene, but not too much. So I'm, I'm getting more contrast in my image right now just by doing that levels adjustment. You can see there's some lens corrections going on too. But just by doing that levels adjustment it creates more contrast. Then I like to adjust shadows a bit. You know, I'm probably going to boost the shadows in this a little bit. I'm gonna move the midtone slider left and right, to find out where I like it. I like lowering the midtones here a little bit, creating more contrast from highlights into shadows. Highlights, I'm gonna pull back, that's the sky. I just know I'm gonna pull those back a fair bit, it's creating more, uh, more contrast in the sky. Contrast, I don't, I don't like to adjust a lot at this point. I'd rather do that in effects. That's more of an effects move for me. And then I like looking at the white balance. In this case, I definitely want to warm it up. I remember it being a little bit warmer color. I think my auto white balance added a bit more blue than it should have. Plus, I just like a warmer image in general in the landscape. Not every time, you know, there's always those Antarctic exceptions to the rule, but in general, I like it a little bit warmer. So there you go. I've got my basic raw processing done. And my frustration with a lot of other software using presets is that, you know, the minute you apply a preset, it to really get the look, it had to nuke a lot of these basic raw processing settings that are in develop in, in our Photo Raw 2020. Instead, I'm gonna jump in here to presets and I'm gonna go into my, my four season presets. And I actually have a whole set I created back in 2019 from images in Death Valley that are kind of those warm summer tones. And I'm gonna, gonna open that up. I'm in the quick view browser. I got there, I'm gonna hit escape here one time. I got there by clicking these four little, this little symbol to the right here and going into the Death Valley presets. And you can make these bigger and smaller. You might open it and find them really small. If you hit the plus key on your keyboard, it makes them bigger, minus key makes them smaller. And I'm really gonna go through in here and just look at, you know, more worried about tone. We can always adjust color a little bit. I'm looking at tone and a bit of color, you know, what do I like best? I'm kind of liking convection storm in that top row as I run through these choices. Rim lights kind of nice. 
I think I'm going to go with Convection Storm. It's got a nice realistic look to it. I'm going to close that panel on the left so that we get back to a, a better view here. And then I want to look into effects. It didn't change my develop settings at all. But when I go into effects, I want to turn off each and every one of these filters so that I can see what they're doing. It, it's just saving me the time of going in, selecting, clicking them. I'm going to have a look at the tone enhancer. And what that's doing, it's boosting contrast a bit. It's reducing highlights, it's boosting shadows. It's just adding even more contrast. And you turn it off and turn it on. And I think what it's doing for the scene is good. There's no place it looks like I need to mask it out. It looks, and I could, if I wanted to, mask it out. That's the power of effects. Then let's have a look at the sunshine filter. I think the sunshine filter is creating that whole, it's enhancing that, that diffuse light that was coming into the foreground and, and making it a little bit more intense. So, you know, you can, you can fiddle with the amount you could fiddle with the warmth a little bit if you'd like to. Just kind of mess around with it a little bit. Get it to taste for your particular image. Dynamic contrast, that's going to add some sh localized sharpening, localized uh, localized uh, uh, contrast, micro contrast. So when we turn that on, it's just adding. It's kind of my basic setting. Again, you know, at a sub-level of presets, you can also create styles within your different uh, effects filters. So if you're constantly setting something like I am, I tend to like this 5, 12, 16. I've created a, a style by just saving a new style and named it my dynamic contrast. I can tell I started when I was building this preset with that Hudson's dynamic contrast style because it's 5, 12, 16. That's kind of my basic setting. And then I pulled opacity back. And it's just, if you, you turn that on and off, you see the whole image just gets a little pop, a little punch, a little extra sharpness. And sometimes you want to kind of uh, jump in and have a look at, you know, is that creating any halos on edges or anything? You see there's a couple down there hiking the trail. That's kind of cool. And it looks like it's not. It looks just fine. Bounce back out. Color enhancer. Turn that on. Have a look at it. And here's where I often go in and make some minor adjustments. You know, here I might take the saturation back on the yellows a little bit. I might even move those toward orange just a touch. I want a little bit more realism. It's looking a little too saturated in the yellows. And so, you know, this is how I use effects presets. I'm not going to just click it and forget it. Turn on the photo filter. I think that's a little little extreme i'm going to back off the opacity of that filter a little bit just blend it in softer and then the vignette anytime there's a vignette you know i tend to add vignettes to most of my portfolio images i think it just draws the eye to the important part of the scene but that definitely needs to be customized for each and every uh each and every image so the first thing i do with a vignette is i turn the feather all the way down so i can see it sometimes i'll turn the brightness down a little bit so i can really see that vignette the feather is just how fast is it being applied how soft is it being feathered in and then i can adjust the roundness in this in this case i want it to be pretty round and i want it to be a lot smaller and then i grab the centering tool by clicking right there on that little target and bring it right down to the part of the image that i want the viewer's attention focused on it's that that little um that little, I don't know why I have my masking brush right now, but it's that little area where this, this river gravel, this dry stream bed is flowing down through Golden Canyon. And then I'll turn my feather back up and just adjust the brightness so that you can't even tell there's a vignette. It's just for some reason, your eye is drawn to this part of the scene where I want it. And there you go. We turned preview on and off. We made a dramatic difference to this image. It just serves as a great starting point. Ooh, you know, and I, I mentioned, we're going to talk about how to use these presets. We're going to talk about how to reverse engineer and learn from them. We're going to talk about creating your own for your own style. But I also want to take questions throughout. So Yeah, definitely. And that's an awesome before and after, Hudson. And I wanted to remind everybody, if you have any questions, use the Q&A box there at the bottom. Uh, we'll kind of take a break in between each one of these edits to kind of go through and answer questions as as, uh, as Hudson continues editing. That's a beautiful before and after Hudson. I have to commend you for that. While we wait for um, questions to come in on that particular image, um, I wish there was a way I could submit my own images to have you edit. Hudson, is there a way to do that? 
we're going to be doing that next week, right? That's we're right. That. So um, everybody, to, so you know, next Thursday, Hudson, or this Thursday, I should say, Hudson will be editing photos submitted by you. And if you go to the On One blog, there's a little link there to submit your raw images unedited. And next Thursday, we're going to do another live event. Hudson's going to edit your photos. And it should be a lot of fun. I just wanted to make sure everyone knew of that opportunity. Again, if you have questions for Hudson about the edits during this time, go ahead and use the Q&A box there at the bottom. I don't see any questions coming in yet, uh, Hudson. So if you want to continue on to the next. One more little uh, plug for that whole uh, discussion we just had about next week's live edit, your photo, our look, is Nathan and I have talked a little bit about this, and we've agreed <laughs> that I'm not going to spend any time at all, really, going through and editing these in advance and practicing. So it's really going to kind of be on the fly. We can all work together. You know, as if you were encountering the image for the first time, I'll show you my process of doing that. So they're going to, they're going to spring some stuff on me. It might be kind of fun. All right. I had, so let's, I had to talk him into it, everybody, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, mm. it seems only, you know, I want to do one more just dramatic edit really quick. This is a, a photo from a scouting trip that Rick and I did in Joshua Tree uh, National Park this, this spring. And we're actually thinking about running a workshop. Next spring, most of you guys know Rick LePage. He's, he writes the On One User Guide. He's a long time On One uh, guy. Let's just put it that way. And um, I'm going to jump in here and I'm going to just do a quick edit on this. We're going to do the same thing where it's this is the base raw image out of my Z7. This is this beautiful uh, monolithic piece of granite with the Joshua tree next to it that, that's kind of an iconic shot in the park that Rick and I were able to find. I'm going to hold down that J key once again. You can see that. The whites are, are pretty blown out quickly. And actually, I want to back it off a little bit more, just watching that histogram. Um, just looking at the scene, too. I can tell that the, the yellows, you know, that green and red are kind of getting a little bit blown out. I'm going to pull the whites a fair bit back here. And I'm even going to pull exposure back just to try to get a little bit more color in here before I even adjust the highlights. I'm really looking at this bit of sky here. And you can see the whole foreground is getting pretty dark in that process but it's a raw file and there's lots of latitude to do that i'm going to grab my j key and pull the black slider now you can see i'm getting a little bit of pure black around the roots there i'm going to pop my shadows up here comes some more detail back into our scene i think mid-tones i'm going to move left and right in this case i'm going to boost those a little bit uh, and contrast you know again i don't i don't touch contrast too much Let's have a look at color temperature. I think I'm going to warm it just a little bit. And then let's run in. And this is still one of those deserty kind of scenes. I'm going to jump back into my Death Valley summer presets. And as I run through here, I'm looking at these. Hmm, last light's kind of nice. Light shadow, rim light. Look what that's pulling out of the sky without losing the foreground here. I'm just going to click on that. Boom. I mean, <laughs> that's that's actually pretty good without even doing a whole lot of adjust. Boom. I'm gonna I'm gonna close this panel back down to get a little bigger image as I'm editing. And I want to run up and you know, this this preset's only done effects things. I definitely want to change the vignette. And sometimes when an image looks this good with just a simple preset addition, you know, I'll just kind of check that isn't doing anything I don't like. The, the dynamic contrast, let's make sure it's not adding any halos. That looks nice and sharp, no halos. Uh, I come back, I'm going to look at the, I've got, I forgot to turn this color enhancer off. Let's look at this color enhancer. I might tone the yellow back just a little bit on this one. Just again, you know, bringing the, the saturation down. And you can see it, this starts to, to show you what I'm talking about reverse engineering. We'll talk about this more in a second. Or maybe we'll just talk about it now. As you as you run through this whole thing, if you're newer to Photo Raw and using effects, and you apply a preset like this that looks really good on your image, well, you can think, well, how did how did Hudson do that, or how did the guys at On One and the, the the folks at On One pull this off? And you know, maybe that's what I should do with this image. And take a look. And what I've done is is boosted contrast a bit, pulled down highlights, pulled up shadows. It's a more nuanced move when you do that in effects than if you do it in develop. And the great thing about it is if it messes up some part of the image, you can always go in and mask it out, you know, either with a soft brush or a luminosity mask. 
You can go in and protect highlights, shadows, or skin tones from the from that effects filter being applied. You have all this power with each effects filter to blend it into the image. It's not a global edit. Uh, so we'll, we'll call that good for the tone enhancer. Looking in at dynamic contrast, we talked about this a second ago. If I turn this on, it's that same kind of 5, 12, 16 I frequently use, but you know we haven't talked about exactly what that means. Uh, when you go in and have a look at this image, the small dynamic contrast setting really adjusts little tiny details in the scene. It's, it's gonna make, you can see that the texture in that granite gets more pronounced. It, it's adding micro contrast to tiny little elements in the scene. And if you move the medium details, it's just slightly larger contrast edges, you know, more the bigger grainier block here, the edges between the branches and the trees. It's doing a little noise in there too. I probably would do a bit of noise reduction to this. And then the large slider is really affecting those big edgy, you know, the edge of the rock. We're starting to get a little bit of a halo adding too much of that. So come back to, you know, my normal setting. I like a little bit of this. I think it just adds the perfect amount of kind of a pop and micro contrast and interest to a scene. You turn it off, you turn it on, and you can actually see it even without zooming in, especially on the rock and the tree and the tree's bark. Color enhancer, why did he add two color enhancers? Well, you almost have to run through and look at each color band. This one's really working on the yellows and the reds in the scene, boosting those kind of warm tones. It's taking the yellows and moving them much more towards orange, which works well in skies like this. Um, boosting saturation a little bit, I might pull that back some like I talked about doing. Greens, it's boosting saturation. Might want to boost brightness a little bit. There's some green in that tree, so we're just adjusting it for this image. Just you know, not much going on in Aqua. Whatever setting I did, did a little bit of saturation boost across the board, and it moved purples a little more towards red, or magenta a little more towards red from purple. Um, the second color enhancer, I can't remember why I added a second color enhancer. Oh, it's all about the sky. It's boosting saturation in the sky. I might as well come back and drop the brightness a little bit on those blues too, just to make the sky a little bit darker in this scene. And then the vignette, once again, just draws the eye. I often add a vignette just really, really softly to my presets. You can see it's minus 22. If we pull this feather back, you can see it's really big. It's kind of designed for you to go in and readjust yourself. So again, on this one, I'm gonna make it really round because these two, there's no reason seems like kind of a round scene between the tree and that rock right there. I want that, that vignette to just draw your eye there. I'm going to size it even a little bit smaller. I'm going to turn that feather all the way back up and I can kind of darken the edge of the frame. I don't want you to be able to see it. I don't want it to stand out that I added a vignette. If I do that, you're going to be like, whoa, that's a heavy vignette. I want it to be subtle. I don't want to block the shadows out, but I want to draw your eye to that tree in the obelisk. And now if we take a look at before and after, super, super dramatic. Um, and I just think, you know, a preset can be a shortcut to finding the route to getting that look in your image. And the more you work with your own images, developing your own style and doing edits and effects, I think the next big thing I'll talk about is, is how you can start creating your own presets that reflect your own editing style and your own editing choices in on one uh, and then use those as a toolkit to really get a head start on on your edits any questions coming in nathan oh yes definitely there we've woken the beast they've got lots of questions for us we'll just start i'll go in order um i apologize if i mispronounce your name haken asks, do you ever use AI auto in develop Hudson? You know, occasionally I'll hit that button just to sort of, you know, check an image when I'm running through and calling and, and sorting and seeing, you know, what does it look like with this? But I do like to go in and, you know, call me a micromanager. I like to get those tones exactly like I want them with myself. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan. I'm, I'm like you. I will use it. What I like about the AI auto is you can apply it and then you can dial it back. So it's got yep. its own slider. So um, it's uh, for the 
call me lazy. I want to quickly just enhance my photo and bring dial it back to uh, the range I like, and then I'll go in and uh, kind of tinker a little bit more if I feel like it. Okay, next question comes from David Price. He wants to know, uh, these presets are desert themed. Can they be used on other subjects such as beaches or stone buildings? Oh yeah, you know, it's, it's hey, and hey David. Um, when I go in and create presets, I kind of do them seasonally. This one is less desert themed than it is kind of a summer theme. I always think of those desert scenes as kind of warm, kind of dry, kind of summery. I have spring presets from the Palouse. It doesn't mean they have to be used in, in Northwest farmland. Mm -hmm. uh, I have winter presets from Patagonia because it's kind of a blue, snowy, icy, you know, colder environment fall presets from the Northwest, but you know, anytime you want to just boost the, the, the sort of yellows and oranges and, and fall color. So I, I try to create a set of presets every year. I'm working on my 2020 ones right now. Uh, and it's really just sort of revamping the main presets that I use to take advantage of the latest version of the software and reflect my, my sort of advancement in editing knowledge that hopefully occurs every year a little bit. Uh, and, and I tend to theme them seasonally. So I'm, I'm thinking awesome. about it. Yeah. Okay, we, so we got a couple more questions still actually. And these, I'll combine these two because they're sort of related. Uh, Gills wants to know, um, hello, how do you remove halos in horizons after using dynamic contrast? And uh, in that same breath, Bruce would ask the question, do you mask the dynamic contrast just to the rock and trees? So kind of a tricky one, Hudson, I'll let you go first. Well, it, it totally depends. Um, there are there are some scenes where the way that the halos occur would be really difficult to mask out, and I'll just back off the dynamic contrast and adjust the small, medium, and large details, zoomed in, and get rid of it. You know, bring it to the point where it's not creating a problem. Because if you do create haloing with dynamic contrast or the HDR look filter will do that as well with the compression slider if you overdo it. Uh, it'll propagate through everything else that you're doing with your editing and it'll make it worse and worse and worse. And in some cases you can even if you've got some noise in your image, you, you can add halos to the little noise details, particularly with that small slider. So it's something you have to be aware of. A lot of times though, just like you asked, it's just along a ridge line where there's a high contrast edge between say, you know, a backlit mountain with the sunset and bright sky in the background. In that case, you know, if there's not a whole lot of detail in the sky, it's usually pretty easy to take a small soft edge brush and just paint along that edge to remove or reduce the dynamic contrast. Sometimes I'll do it at 60% and see if that takes care of it. And if it doesn't take a second pass at it. Um, and then, you know, if you're having, if you're using both HDR and dynamic contrast in a, in a, in a set of filters and, and effects, then, you know, copy that masked ridge line and paste it on the other one that's creating a problem. Keep that in your back pocket. Don't do it twice. Actually, there's another uh, quick tip too for you guys out there. Um, if you want, you can actually rename your effects filters. Um, if you want to remember what uh, you applied to a certain area, if you had a mask, you can actually double click in the uh, field title and rename them. Cool stuff. One more question, and I'm not sure if I completely understand it, but is there a way to tip the vignette in On One? Hudson, does that make sense to you? Tip, maybe that's a typo. Ah, uh, you know, that's, that's something that I, I I have sometimes wished for a bit too. Um, there isn't. It's either going to be kind of elliptical or wide or circular with that shape setting. But what you can do if you really have a need is kind of create your own vignette with a soft brush. You know, if you go, let me show you. Let me jump back to screen share here. And, you know, it, it, if, well, one thing that you can do is with your vignette, if there's a part of the scene that you don't want vignetted, you can just paint in or out on the vignette's own filter, but you can also go into local adjustments. Um, and in that case, you know, let's say you want to darken, uh, let's see, yeah, let's say you want to darken everything but the outer edge. I mean, you, you can create a big soft brush Zoom panels kind of interfering with my tool settings here. 
you guys don't see my zoom settings you guys for the for the, <laughs> for the thing but let's make it you know uh 60 opacity with 100 percent feather it's a nice big brush and say you wanted to create some some oddly shaped thing i mean you can you can just sort of paint in here however whatever style you wanted and then maybe back the opacity down even more make your brush smaller and you know just just bring it in one more time you can just sort of you can create your own thing and then you can take your sliders and adjust what the intensity are after the fact so you can you can sort of custom make your own with all the controls that you have in develop so with that kind of technique, you can even go in and do things like changing the color balance and in the inside versus the outside or the, or the saturation or. Um, yeah, this kind of goes along with a question that just came in as well about using the local adjustments to build a vignette and rotate and using the gradient tools um, to do that. And that gives you kind of full control to um, manipulate how you want the vignette to be applied beyond what just the filter can do. True story. Absolutely right. Awesome. All right. And David Price asks, uh, Hudson, can you also use the apply to protect filters to adjust the vignette? You sure. can. Sure. I, it, it, if you're, well, let's jump back into that one. I mean, if you go into any of your effects filters, including the vignette, and let's open it up here, and you hit this little tool, the little settings tool, you've got your protect skin tones. If there's a person in there and you don't want to darken their face or you know, they're, they're, there's someone shirtless running around in your scene on a beach, it'll protect all the skin tone in there. Um, if you don't want it to hit shadows, it'll, it'll protect your shadows. So you can see that that vignette is leaving my foreground when I pull the shadow slider. Did you see that? Pull it back down, look at right here on the granite, pull it back up brightened up in there not being reduced as much so absolutely those protection sliders and these are a really powerful thing remember i got there by clicking that little that little settings wheel inside the filters window you click the mask you get to do adjustments to the mask you click the little settings wheel you get all the crazy blending options that you have in photoshop with uh with with previews of them all happening and you also get these really cool things that you don't get in Photoshop, like the ability to protect the highlights in your image from that particular filter, the shadows or the skin tones, really cool stuff. Jump back out of here. I have one prepped here that I'm just kind of proud of. I was, I was futzing around with. This is a, an HDR blend in, in on one of these two Sunstar images at Arch Rock and Joshua Tree. And if I, if I jump in here, I think I did a little bit of raw processing already on this one. I feel like you guys need to watch me set the white and black point in shadows. You get the idea of how I do that. But if I if I go into my presets and I am still I'm gonna focus in on my my desert ones for this. If I go to Dawn Sunstar and just click it, it's just I mean, I, I don't think I need to do very much else to this image. It just kind of is, is set for it. I might go in as usual and go into my color enhancer and just reduce the yellow saturation a bit and the orange saturation a bit. But boom, you know, <laughs> in the before and after, it's just super dramatic. And I, I love that the, the, the name on that one, I did it with the Sunstar image. So it works really well with the Sunstar image too. And this is a trick, you know, I, I see a lot of people doing Sunstars when, you know, you got a clear sky like this. Well, there's a little edge right there. I probably would jump, jump in here. Probably a dynamic contrast is helping to create. Well, it could just be some with the HDR processing too. I go back and drop contrast a little bit. But, um, but I notice a lot of people doing these Sunstar images and you know if if you if you do it as a as a um, as a HDR capture one on the meter one two stops underexposed you're gonna you're gonna find that you're able to get sometimes if you if you get just the right amount of sun exposed and using a mirrorless camera where you can look through the viewfinder and hold down the depth of field preview stopped all the way down this is at f16 with my 20 millimeter 
you can you can get every bit of that sun star even with a pure white sky pure blue sky instead of it being white here and then with on one's you know highlight recovery the new highlight recovery it even keeps that color tone a little bit better um, so that's fun stuff um and i wanted to talk a little bit about creating your own presets so you know the process i would go through for that you know here here we have uh an image in joshua tree all these are a little bit similar i'm going to jump in and work on this one i think it's pretty much straight out of the camera and well wait a minute i might have actually done a little processing on this one yeah let's work with this one because i've done the basic raw processing on this one and we'll go in and just start doing the kinds of effects i'm actually going to kill these I, I was playing around with it i'll go in and you know with this image i don't think i need a lot to do with the tone enhancer the tones are really quite nice the light was good you know maybe well maybe i'll go in and just barely boost the shadows a little bit I don't even know. I don't even know that it needs that boost contrast a little bit since I don't do a lot of that uh, inside the develop app. And then I'm going to go ahead and do dynamic contrast. So I'm, I'm doing this kind of the old fashioned way. Um, and to me that that dynamic contrast, even in its base natural setting, is a little bit much. That's why I've created my my own little style here. Once you adjust the sliders to a way you like them, you can save a style and name it. Here's my dynamic contrast. That's about 5, 12, 16 with the opacity backed off a little bit. And I want to have a look up in here and make sure it's not creating any problems. Turn it on and turn it off. Just giving it some pop. And back out. And then I would go into a color enhancing filter and open that guy up. And I like to look through on one styles. I'm guessing in this scene, I'm gonna want uh, to kind of green up the trees. It's spring, the, the color's really green. A lot of times I love deserts, one of my favorites, but I think in this case, yep, foliage is where I wanna go. And I'll probably go in and just tweak the sky just a little bit. You know, maybe I'll boost its saturation just a smidge. Let's brighten this back just a little bit. And that looks really good to me. And then, you know, let's let's add a vignette. And I'll go in and I'll make it a big softy. And I'll pull the feather all the way back and I'll just resize it for the tree. Change its brownness a little bit. Move it a smidge. Basically something like that. And then pull its feather back and really tone it down i love that photo hudson no, thank you so i turn it off turn it on now the trick is i say hmm you know let's see how this works on other images like this where there's some greenery in there and you know, this might be kind of a fun spring style preset so what i'm going to do is go up here to settings i'm going to say save settings as a preset and I want to turn off develop. I don't want to add any of those individual image develop settings that set the white point, the black point, the tone, the white balance, all that stuff. What I do want to do is effects. And if I open this, I don't want to apply any masks that I put in there. It's just a generalized preset. And I'll go ahead and click. I'm going to put it in a category. You can create a new category. I have one called, under my presets, I have one called preset builder, my preset builder. And I'll name it Spring Joshua Tree 1. And click Save. Boom. And now, you know, if I go back in to browse here, and I take a look at, say, this one, and go into Edit, and we do a little bit of adjustments. I'm gonna pull the whites up with the J key held down, just like we've talked about. So I start losing those highlights. Kind of losing some highlights around the edge of the tree. You know, it's really, really subtle, but right in here, 
Um, I'm going to back off just a little bit. And pull the highlights down for the sky a little bit. I'm going to set that black point. This is going to add contrast to our scene. I'm starting to lose the shadows in the tree. Pull the shadows up a little bit to get that shadow detail back. And then let's just warm the whole image up a touch. And then let's see, you know, we'll go in here uh, and have a look. I'll come out of my Death Valley presets and my Four Season presets. And I'm going to go into my preset builder and we should have Spring Joshua Tree. Now let's see how that one works on this image. It looks nice. I would probably tweak it a little bit, change its vignette. But, you know, if I, I will create, you can see I've got a number of them in there. As I'm editing and I do different things and I work on different images, I'll have that folder of potential presets. And then you just start kind of, the next time you open up a new folder of images and you've done some raw processing, open up your preset builder and see which ones of those work well across a broad variety of images. And you can start kind of tweaking them, resaving them as Joshua Tree Spring 2 if you find some settings that work a little bit better. And eventually those might become some of your go-to presets with your own style of editing, that same way that you like to use, to use the effects filters and stack them in on your images to get the look that matches your style of photography. You know, if you start creating those presets that, that work with your images and your style, all of a sudden you'll have a starting point. You'll save yourself so much time by just populating that filter stack with the kinds of filters that you like to use that match with that type of image. And once you get a series of them that are all a little bit different, different images are going to look better with one versus another. Does that make sense? I guess so. If you're talking to me, you need to print out that photo so we can hang it up here at the office. <laughs> All right. We do have a few questions coming in if you're ready, Hudson. Yep. Let's hit it. All right. Gills wants to know, do you use the sun flare tool sometimes? You know, I, I'm so much more of a, I'm a huge affectionado of capturing those sun stars out in the field. It's been, you know, I love panoramas. I love capturing actual in-camera sun stars. I'm not a big sky replacement guy. I'm not a big, let's create a sun star where one wasn't in the field person. You know, everybody's got their own line that they draw. That's just something I don't tend to use much. Um, I do tend to buy lenses based on whether or not they're going to create great sun stars. And yesterday I got my new Nikon 21.8 Z lens and I'm going to see if it performs creating sun stars as well as my old Nikon F mount 21.8 Sunstar lens, which is literally something I carry in my bag just for sun stars, because you saw those sun stars that I've been editing. That's out of this lens. So it's funny. I have these on my desk just because I'm kind of doing some calibrating and some testing and some aperture sharpness testing with the two to see which one's a better and the new one looks better. But I'm excited. It's a great question because the tool's sitting on my desk. I tend to do it in camera. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you. And if you have questions for Hudson, use the Q&A there at the bottom of the Zoom window. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the On One Video Library, YouTube, and all over social media shortly after we finish airing. We've got a couple more questions coming in here, Hudson. Susie, or Suze, excuse me, how do you, do you back out of a preset if you decide not to use a preset? Hmm. That's a great question. Let's, let's share the screen and I'll, I'll walk through how you do that. All right. So let's say we just applied this preset and I'm like, Ugh, you know, I don't, I don't really like that. Well, if you're in develop right now, I'm still looking at all my develop settings. And if I hit reset, it would reset just the develop. I'm in the develop tab. It would reset just the develop settings. If I hit reset all, it takes it back to, to nothing. It's back to raw. If I'm in effects and I hit reset, it's just going to nuke that all those settings. The, the filter stack is gone. Now let's hit, hit command Z, control Z for the PC users and bring those back. The other thing that I can do is run over here and let's jump out of my preset builder. Let's go into my presets, up, into my 2019 presets and into the spring presets and have a look at what some of those Palouse, oops, I think I just hit it them do that. That is definitely not the right one. But we'll jump in here and we could go have a look for hmm, field of flowers, long shadows. 
puffy clouds. Mm, actually, kind of like rolling green, even though that soft sunset, sky drama. You know, in, a lot of these work. It's really, this one's darkening the sky too much. This one's kind of a nice side lit hills. That actually makes sense that that would work with this image because these are side lit hills. Boom, you know, and it just replaced all the filters that we had a second ago. So by clicking on the other one and not holding down any keys, you're not additively adding all those filters, you're replacing all the filters if you click on a different preset. And a lot of times what I'll do is I'll, I'll look through that whole stack in the, in the preset um, quick view browser like we've got right now, make sure they're as big as possible by hitting that plus key. And if you hit the minus key, it's very difficult to tell which one of these is best. By, by making them big, you get a nice big look. And, and I'll run through and I'll say, hmm, you know, rolling green looks kind of nice. I don't like what it's doing to the sky with puffy clouds. I'd have to go in and adjust that. Um, coming down, I like side lit hills. So rolling green and side lit hills. And, you know, let's say I click side lit hills like I just did. We got that look. Then I could, you know, I could close down my stack for a second and get a bigger view here. And I could say, well, what does rolling green look like in comparison? Literally, I think it's better. You know, you can, you can work that way. When you get a bigger view that, you know, you kind of use your quick view browser to pick a few you want to try and you can just click between them. And again, you close this down, open up your right panel. I'm just clicking these little symbols in the bottom corners to open and close those panels and get a bigger view on my laptop screen here. Don't want any of it, hit reset. You just undid it back to the straight develop settings. move on to some other questions awesome yeah david says thank you hudson at the end because it's such a pleasure to watch someone who is good at creating it great images oh thank you that, little that, shout out don't stroke his ego too much david he's got plenty <laughs> big, big enough head as it is you know i will i will say that i had such a good time uh with rick in joshua tree and you know I, I know we're all sort of sequestered right now, but that's a workshop I'm really, really looking forward to this spring uh, because it was it was a place where there are all these crazy granite shapes and cool trees and interesting landscapes and background hills. And, the, and it's all in a small area near a cool town with fun eats. And you literally, I feel like I could stop the van anywhere and people could fan out and there's a compositional playground where everybody would be creating different images and we look at it at the end of the day and be like, wow, I didn't even see that, but I saw this other cool thing. And it, it, it's just, a, it, it, that was a joy to bounce around there with our good friend Chet Steele that we met at our Moab workshop last year and, and photograph out there because I had never been, Rick kept talking it up. He'd been there on his travels with his wife uh, and he was right. It's, it's a great, great place to photograph. So whether you can come on my workshop in the spring or not, in, if you're down in that LA area, get out of the city and go check out Joshua Tree. It's cool. Definitely. Yeah. So we got a couple more questions, actually. Um, Hudson David Harris asks, do you ever stack presets? I now, really do. I really don't, but Nathan, do you do you do that? I, you know, I don't. We have the ability to stack presets. Um, I find that if I have a preset that I like and I apply it, but I want to continue to adjust, I just add another filter to it. Mm -hmm. But uh, there is that ability, and some people do like doing that. Um, I think it's personal preference, right, Hudson? Yeah, I would totally go with personal preference. You know, one thing I didn't show that is really cool that I, I appreciate in Photo Raw 2020 is when you are using presets and we jump in here, you literally have this fade slider. So as you add the rolling green preset, you can actually dial it back if you want. It's just a, all it's doing really is changing this overall opacity slider on the filter stack, but it's kind of neat. I, I think that's a nice little added touch. So Awesome. And again, if you have any questions, use the Q&A down there at the bottom. This was an awesome presentation about presets. Hudson, I appreciate you doing it. Um, I think everybody, since we're all stuck inside, go spend the rest of the day, create, create five, 10 presets in a category, maybe from a shoot that you did at the ocean. And then you'll always have a, your own category of presets to do. Um, 
And of course, uh, Hudson, the uh, gear questions are coming in. And I know, <laughs> I know you love talking about gear. Uh, if you have questions right now, we've got a few more minutes here left. Hudson, did you have anything else you want to show or should we just go and dive into some more of these questions? We can dive into questions. Uh, and I, I want to give a big shout out for next week, you know, submit those raw yes. images and we'll run through and process them, you know, relatively sight unseen. Obviously, we'll pick a few out, but I'm not going to spend a bunch of time figuring it out. I'll figure it out with you all. Um, and if you want to OD on me, I've started during these these uh, these coronavirus shutdown weeks since I'm not in Cuba like I'm supposed to be right now in a workshop, and I'm probably not going to be in workshops most of the beginning of this year. Uh, I'm actually doing little office hours on Tuesday mornings, and, and you can sign up for those. Hit me up via email or, or however. I'm actually going to be talking about manual focus and autofocus and when to use which and how to do it best uh, this Tuesday morning at 10, my own, just here in the studio, so. Just a little yeah. shout out for that. My little office hours are, are live and up on my website, HudsonHenry.com. So. Awesome. Yeah. And um, I'll show a little quick demo. Here's my screen. You can actually see if you go to On One under Learn, you go to the blog down there, which is where I'm at right now. You'll see uh, submit your photos for the Your Photo Our Look webinar. And here's all the instructions you need to get started for uh uh, submitting a photo, submit as many raw photos as you'd like. Again, another great resource is under the Learn tab. You go to webinars, register for all the awesome webinars that we have them coming up over the next couple of weeks. That's just some quick hits for you. Okay, Hudson, I'm done. Oh, you know, Let's, what, what, wait, show your screen one more time while you got sure. while you have the site up. Do me a quick favor. You right bet. There. There, there we go. Show everybody how to get to the photo critiques too, because Rick and I are, you know, we. We just uh, did photo critiques this week for March. And I, I would love, you know, anybody that's stuck around, the photo critiques are a super valuable learning tool. Um, and show them how to, from, from, the, from the my. Uh, so what the, the critiques always get posted here to the blog. And Rick writes these really, really awesome um, in-depth uh, critiques. He goes through all of them. Whoop, that's, this is the recap. Here we go. February yep. critiques recap. Yeah. So you can find them on the blog and um, there's a video, obviously Hudson, you and Rick do those together, but Rick does these really awesome um, written ones too. And he talks about them. So they're really great blog posts there. Um, is that what you needed Hudson? Yeah. And I just, you know, when you're up in your, your membership benefits, if you click on your account, you can find the critiques up there and you can find the galleries where we submit. There's a, there's a critiques gallery. Mm -hmm. And I just encourage people in the downtime, go in and look at those monthly critique galleries, comment on people's images, um, share the love. And, and, and I think you'll find that there's almost no time better spent to develop your own photography skills than looking through other people's images, whether it's the greats or your, you know, your, your, your comrades in the on one community. So, and I know I'm talking mainly to people that are in plus, I'm sure a lot of you are in plus. That's a great benefit of plus and I'd like to see more people taking advantage of it because I just think it's an awesome learning tool. Yeah, definitely. Um, the next critique round is gonna open up on the seventh. It's the first Tuesday of every month. We open it up for a period of time to submit. So uh, it's, there's 12 of them a year. You've got an opportunity to participate. Take advantage of that. And, um, and questions. I, I feel like it's a like it's a real privilege to look through everybody's lens that submits to that. You know, it's like a, a travel the world every month through all the plus community's eyes, and it's super super fun. So, all right, questions. You bet. Um, let's start with uh, glass polarizing filters. Do you use them? Roger wants to know. I do. I use Hoya HD three circular polarizers, and all uh, you know. To, to, to completely have transparency. I'm a Hoya ambassador, but the reason for that is they came to me several years ago and asked me to try out their new HD3 filters and write a review for them. And I loved them uh, and their HD3 UV filters, which are a protective filter, but don't seem to have any image degradation. They're not cheap filters, but they're really, really good. Um, and so, yeah, I've become a Hoya guy and I do use their, their polarizing filters and I use them to control reflections, whether it's on glass or on water or even wet leaves in an in a, in a overcast forest. It can just make the color come out through that reflection and you can see the bottom of the lake or see the reflection of the mountain in the lake, your choice. Uh, same thing with rainbows, it'll make rainbows pop out. 
and carefully used if you're shooting to the north or to the south when the sun is at kind of a low but not all the way down angle it can really make clouds pop and contrast you just be careful with a wide angle lens because it will polarize that that angle at 90 degrees from the sun and it stop polarizing as you move towards the sun or dead away from it with it at your back and so you can wind up with half of the sky white and half the sky really contrasting in blue so it's a great tool with you know moderate wide angle to telephoto just the ultra wide be careful Definitely. A couple other great questions coming in. Um, Hudson, you touched on a little bit, but so what do you think or what do you look for in a lens that will make good sun stars? <laughs> you just have to test it. You know, for one thing, you want it to be pretty sharp stopped all the way down. What makes a great sun star is having a tiny, 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 very bright point source of light and then narrowing that aperture with the aperture blades down to a make it even even smaller and then these little rays come blasting out depending on how many sort of points are there how many how many aperture blades there are and so different lenses if you, if you do a little research sony 16 to 35 is fantastic and it kind of is born from canon 16 to 35 is fantastic and nikon's pretty much every nikon 21.8 is fantastic i haven't i just literally got this yesterday and it's been cloudy so I don't know yet, but I have high hopes for this one. If it isn't great, I'll probably send it back since it's $1,000. Um, but, and, and, you know, let's face it, we're all making a little, well, at least I'm making quite a bit less money right now with the coronavirus. I imagine a lot of people are. Um, Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think that, that it, it really is just a thing that comes out of the engineering. You want a nice sharp lens stop all the way down because the way you're going to do it is stop all the way down. And it's funny, in the days of, of the uh, pre-DSLR with live view, you used to just burn your retina out trying to figure it out. And then with live view, you can kind of hold the camera squinting between yourself and the sun and watch the live view and try to kind of hold it video camera style and get it without you know, looking through the lens, which you should never do at the sun. And now with the mirrorless, I mean, it's like cheating. You just, I have my, my finger on that depth of field preview. I set the lens to f16. I frame it up with my other eye closed and I'm looking at a TV screen view. It's not too bright for me to look at. And I just move until with the, with the uh, depth of field preview lever held down, the sun star blooms like I want and I snap. It's that easy, it's amazing. And I usually put my camera in a mode where it's shooting one frame, one shot right on the meter and one shot three steps underexposed like that uh, rock art sun star shot I showed you and I put it in burst mode so it's like pa -pa, pa -pa. oh and you want a wide angle lens it's the, 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 the longer the lens the more you're going to get ghosting and flare and have a problem with your sun star wide angle lenses do this much better definitely thanks Hudson and a couple more questions actually we've got three more minutes so let's try to blaze through these as fast as we can um, just purchased a new backpack do you use a harness system to hold your camera while you hike I do. I have, uh, I'm a big F-stop proponent. I just think they build bomb proof, you know, mountaineering grade backpacks that aren't going to fail me. Uh, I like Shimoda's backpacks too, but the F-stop has these um, sort of nil spec little attachment points and they have a guardian system, these little webbing pieces that snap in and out of there really easily and adjust. And they have a Naveen um, adjustable holster that's real lightweight and you can fold the nose of it under and clip it so that it's short for if you have a shorter lens or a 70 to 200 and then you open it up and it gets wider and you can drop a, a 70 to 200 in there i meant a 24 to 70 earlier so it gives you a couple different carrying options real lightweight and i just hang it right on my chest i clip it into the shoulder straps and then there's if you really want to be secure it's got a couple of things that can come around and snap in down near your waist harness from from the bottom of the thing so it's just snug on you it's awesome. great uh, this question comes from dirk um, does the file and size increase if you apply too many filters and i can answer that one for you hudson so since we're non-destructive we store all your edits in the sidecars and those are really small files kilobytes um, since we're writing the information there no it shouldn't shouldn't increase your file size too. And, and even if you're a person who likes to use another raw processor like Lightroom and edit outside, if you bring it into on one and you're doing it, you know, you're not doing it fully raw, you're bringing in a PSD, it's going to create one layer. In the long run, it's going to put all that stuff on one layer. It'll be a bigger file than it would be without that layer, 
but it's not adding more filters isn't going to make that layer any bigger. Mm -hmm. And next question from Gills, color adjustment tool and color enhancer. Uh, what's the difference? The color adjustment tool is sort of the color enhancer light. I mean, they both do the same thing. The color right. tool has more. With the stuff. color adjustment, you can actually dig in and apply to the highlights, shadows, and midtones on the specific color. So if you really want to drill down on the colors, you can do that. I have to I have to look through that a little bit, but yeah, it's a little highlight thing above it. So it's it's same as the color enhancer you see at the bottom where you apply. You know, if you want to adjust the reds, but it allows you to control whether you want to do that on the highlights, midtones, or shadows. I learn something new to every day. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm that. particularly proud of that one because that's that was a feature that I really wanted. Cool. Um, and two more. We got three more questions, and then I'll let you run. We're out of time as it is. So I'm um, not in a hurry. Actually. Three questions. All right, three questions. I'm getting hungry. It's lunchtime here. And, and I'm hungry too. And <laughs> my, and my, my little boy is itching to bring me avocado toast. I've been getting messages. I have the garage door locked, which the studio is above my, my four car garage here. So, yeah. My son turned four today, so I got to go home oh, and have lunch with him. Yeah. Congrats. That's all. Awesome. Pretty excited. Okay. So, questions are any tips for reducing lens flares when using protection filters? Yeah. So, I would argue that if you're shooting straight into backlight, you know, my, it depends upon your filter. Right now I have on the end of this new 20 millimeter, I have a Hoya HD3 UV filter. Mainly that's just to keep my lens clean. So when I accidentally grab it wrong, I don't put my fingerprint right on that beautiful multi-coating and the nano coating. And so if I'm working in salt water, spray doesn't get on there. And, and if sand is blowing in the wind, it's, I'd rather buy a new UV filter uh, than, than a new lens. And I try to keep them really clean and I find it has basically zilch image degradation and, you know, but different filters are of different quality. If you're using a protective UV filter and you want to shoot a sun star directly into backlight, my, my advice would be whip it off. Unless there's salt spray blowing in that you're wiping off or, sand and trained in 30 mile an hour winds blowing out. You pull this off and all of a sudden you've got a perfectly pristine, clear, un, you know, sullied piece of glass that you're shooting through for that sun star and then just put it back on afterward. In most cases, having a little bit of dust or something on this filter is not going to you know, degrade your image whatsoever. But when you stop all the way down, and make it, it's really going to add that, that close in problem when there's dust on here and also having backlight into it, you're going to get little flares and ghosts. And so my advice is use that UV filter as kind of a, a prophylactic and pull it right off right before you're going to shoot the sun star or the super backlit scene. Good advice. All right. Uh, David asks for next week, uh, the, your photo, our look, how about stitched panoramas? I think those are fair game. You can throw in some stitched panoramas and, and we'll see. We're not going to edit I, all the images we get, but uh, we'll do as many as we can. I would, I would say if you're going to do a panorama, I mean, we're going we're gonna to pick some of these out. You know, try to give me something that's three or four 24 megapixel images, not something that's 10 46 megapixel images because then we'd just all be sitting watching wheels turn no matter what software or computer we're working with, particularly on my laptop. So. Okay, good advice. And last question, and this is a good one to end on. Lee Jones would like to know if you could give one piece of advice for beginning landscape photographers, what would that be? I think the tripod is critical. And if you watch my YouTube, you'll see how much I think the tripod is critical. I think that the tripod and having a tripod that's easy to get your camera onto, I think an L bracket on your camera and a nice rock solid tripod, not something ultra light, not something you have to stoop down to use, not something you have to raise the center column and it becomes un, you know, unstable. Um, I think a rock solid tripod and, and I honestly think that the affordable Manfrotto 500 AH fluid head that lets you just adjust a little left, a little right, a little up, a little down without losing level. It, it, it makes my life easier as more of an advanced landscape photographer. It's going to make your life easier as a beginning landscape photographer to get those little minor adjustments to, to frame up your image. I remember uh, long, long ago, I did a, I did a workshop with Art Wolf and got to know him a little bit and spent a little bit of time with him. And he, he's, he's a fascinating human being and an amazing photographer. And he was raving about 
the fact that you know modern high ISO performance and digital sensors ability to capture more dynamic range, and this is a long time ago, this is before we got to where we are now, was just making it so that he could work without his tripod a lot, handheld in situations that he never could before. But he's like, but for those of you learning, I wouldn't advocate it because what you really need to do, especially for landscape work is slow down, take your time, look at the edges, get that composition just like you want, look at it from different angles. Now, the one thing I'm gonna say about everything I just said that's a caveat is don't just get out of your car and set up the tripod. Spend some time, you know, I, I, I have this thing I tell my workshop students is like, get out with your phone, find some interesting elements, find some things you can use to tell a story about the scene that appeals to you. Look at how things look in your phone put together from different angles and different elevations. Then get your body out with the lens you think you're gonna use based on that and sort of move around with your camera and figure out where you wanna put your tripod up before getting yourself anchored to a tripod where you're trying to like adjust legs and make little, get, get kind of honed in close to where you want to be and then fine tune it. Um, but I really, really, really think that a tripod is a critical tool for just, particularly for landscape photographers, for honing that composition and honing that image and getting it locked in place while you work with the other settings. Awesome. That's great advice, Hudson. And uh, again, appreciate everybody coming. Um, I appreciate Hudson uh, giving the pre presets presentation. Everybody go out, take a bunch of presets, uh, make a bunch of presets today, save your own category. Um, Chris writes, lots of things to think about, have to watch the rerun and take more notes. That's right, Chris, uh, this webinar was recorded. It'll be posted to the uh, On One video library and YouTube shortly after it airs. And uh, I will pass it over again. Uh, Hudson, I'll let you sign off. Thank you so much for doing this. And again, submit your images for your photo or look. We'll see you next Thursday. Hudson's going to go through and edit your images. Go register for more webinars. We have more coming up next week and in the following week. And uh, yeah, stay safe, everybody. Everybody, that's my big thing. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for sitting through it. And uh, I hope I shared something that resonated or was a little bit new and different. And I just want to urge, you know, everybody stay safe out there. I hope that everybody, their friends and family are all safe through this virus thing. It's, it's not so, so definitely. Thanks everybody. All right. Thanks Hudson.